how is everybody doing? And welcome back for another Strength Chat episode. Today, I have not only got one special guest, I've got two special guests for you all today. Today, I am joined by the founders of Athlete Authority. Today, I am joined by the one and only Carl Goodman and Lachlan Wilmot. How are you both doing? Know, we don't even know who to start here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let it, love it. We'll, well, we'll I, let was it, hoping, it. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to do, you know, I've got one special guest and then another bloke and we'd just be left <laughs> to figure out which one was which. I let it out. I let it out. Some of the uh, some of the silences. I know sometimes when there's when there's three on there. Um, but um, no. How are you two? What's been happening in in your worlds? Yeah, going well, mate. We've um, <laughs> we've for for those that know what Sydney's been like the past three months, there's been bloody flu and colds going everywhere, mixed in with COVID. Um, so it's definitely been a unique environment. My uh, my voice might slowly go if you can hear it, but uh, but other than that, mate, it's been great. It's uh, <clears throat> It's been definitely an evolution for us this year. We've we've uh, we've added a number of different, um, I suppose, layers to our business here at Athletes Authority in Sydney. Um, and I think the the evolution of of what we do here, myself and Carl, has has definitely grown over the past six months as well. Where we're certainly empowering a number of our staff to take on some much larger managerial roles and and probably starting to see what the future of Athletes Authority looks like. So. Uh, without delving too deep straight away, mate, it's been a been a big six months, that's for sure. Oh, cool. And how has everything been? Because obviously, I mean, I know people might be fed up of asking a, uh, me me mention about it because obviously, um, it's kind of uh, things are all things are getting better after COVID. How did you both sort of find that? Obviously, being you know, uh, it might have been a slightly different um situation to the U. Well, not slightly different to the UK, but with the lockdowns and and those sorts of things. How did how did you both kind of manage that? And um, how's Athletes Authority now? sort of at the back end of uh, of COVID, if you like? Honestly, COVID, COVID was a massive gift for us, Stephen. Um, you know, coming into COVID of 2020, um, we were uh, uh, performing better than average SMC gym, I would say. Like, it was it was nothing remarkable. We obviously had Lockie doing great things um, and me trying to hold the floor from the business side, but um, there was nothing remarkable per se about what we were doing at that point in time. The two years since has seen us what triple revenue year on year from from twenty twenty one, and then and close to double of the next year, which has, from a growth perspective, um, been a massive challenge, but also awesome for us. To mean it was back in twenty twenty, it was me lock, what three S and C staff and a physio. Um, there's now twenty five of us, maybe wow. even more. I think by the time we had the um, the the new arms of the 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 kind of athletes authority group, it might be close to thirty. Um, so it's the short answer is, mate, COVID was a gift for us. It allowed us to clarify our message, um, add the rehab arm to our program, which has been a great success for us and then for the athletes that we look after. Um, and just generally speaking, you know, helped us. Maybe I'm not sure what it's like in the UK, but I know there were some gyms that didn't make it through mm. um, some natural attrition. Um, we obviously were, were, were strong enough to hold on to make it through. And I think we're kind of benefiting from um from that perseverance and that resilience because yeah the gym's going from strength to strength yeah that that that's great to hear because i know um uh, and and why i asked that is because obviously you know like you say there was unfortunately a, a couple of uh, gym owners that that i actually knew that had to that's closed down whereas mm-hmm. actually um there was there was one coach who actually opened a gym up just after covid and then he's gone from you know strength to strength so you know it's i think it's good to hear that you know you could have used uh or people could have used covid as an opportunity to build on because it was one of those it was one of those things where um i know for the i know for the gym that uh that i currently work at it's uh was an opportunity to get systems in place and and put things in place for because at some point it was going to end it just wasn't going to be right that's it gyms are closed forever now there was going to be a you know sort of uh not to be too cheesy but light at the end of the tunnel if you like there's going to be mm-hmm. there's going to be able to uh progress from there um obviously i did quite a brief uh introduction um to the to the episode um but for everyone listening who might not know the background to athletes authority background to yourselves in terms of you know coaching and performance um do you both just want to give a little bit of a background to yourselves yeah I'll, i've got the i've got the easy one so i'll go first <laughs> um, so i 
semi semi professional rugby union was was what I did as a practitioner as an SNC coach. Um, I opened Athletes Authority in 2016. Um, Lockie jumped on board just just about a year later um, or thereabouts. I mean, I've been doing AA ever since. So um, from a professional background, mine is far less impressive um, <laughs> than Lockie. So we'll leave the best for last, hey? Um, but the yeah, last six years have been AA um, through and through um, and growing, growing their brand here. Yeah, so from my standpoint, it was a, like a, a typical coach who was a, a personal trainer to start and uh, so, sort of cut the teeth there and then uh, shifted into Australian football, um, which for Aussie rules or AFL, um, which obviously is probably not big in leads there, um, but uh, eventually made my way into the pros there. So I was at the GWS Giants there for, for uh, eight years um, and then shifted away and went to the dark side of rugby league um, <laughs> and was the head of performance at Parramatta Eels uh, in the, the National Rugby League here. Um, while I was at the Giants, I had uh, still two years left when me and Carl sort of started to, to talk and, and connect and, and, uh, and partner up. So it was always a desire to, to eventually go to the private sector. Um, you know, I've got two kids now and um, I definitely knew before I even had kids, I, I don't want to be answering to a head coach and, and doing the hours that you do in pro sports uh, with two kids. Um, and hats off to, to anyone that's currently listening in pro sport with kids because it's... Um, <laughs> It's, it's an absolute um, task to be able to do kids by themselves, but then you layer on the, the requirements of pro sports, unbelievable. But, um, but yeah, so then in 2020, really, uh, well, technically the end of 2019, shifted into to athletes authority full time. And, mate, we had fires here, blackouts, rolled into COVID. Um, so, mate, I, I got to absolute baptism of fire coming into the private sector with athletes authority so um you know i always thought i was going to get a bit of a cruisy start and slowly build it before you know it boom my missus was saying oh, i thought we were meant to have less work hours not more but um, but nonetheless uh we are here now and, and as pal said it's 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 given us a, a a route that's probably created and shaped our confidence in our product and our service um and i think to to carl's point before um, he mentioned about the lockdown and you mentioned about a couple of people nailing some systems and everything. I think what the lockdown probably did for us, it, it gave us the balls to be able to tell our athletes how we think they should train rather than trying to cater everything to every individual's need. Um, and that just made it muddy. Um, coming out of COVID, we just, you know, because we were limited staff, limited budget, we just said, well, what's the priority? What, what is the, the big rock? Um, and we nailed it. And lo and behold, within a couple of weeks, we were functioning better than we were before. And we actually were probably more strict in what we did in regards to less sessions, but those sessions were more powerful. Um, what we offered was clearer, much more clarity. Um, and I think that just the perpetuation of that gave us the confidence to keep doing more and more of this culling and this sharpening of the sword. And, and now we're, we're very much just, you know, this is what we do, this is what we don't do. And and it's created a far more powerful brand than probably what we were before. Oh, great. I think, I think from what you mentioned there as well about, you know, uh, knowing what you do yeah. and what you, what you don't do, I think, you know, having that clarity, you know, gives you um, confidence, which is exactly what you've said there, you know, less sessions, but more quality sessions. And um, yeah, interestingly, when you, when you mentioned about uh, Aussie rules, so I actually lived in um, Melbourne uh, for, for just, un for just under a year, obviously, uh, Aussie rules is is that I think that's the only spot that the play that that, that the yes. play in Melbourne, um, and um, I'm still try and watch it when I'm uh, when I'm back over because they show it they show it on BT Sport over here. Still have no idea what's going on, um, but interestingly, when I came back, there's actually a UK um, Aussie rules league which i didn't realize um Maddie, you, you... There's, there's aussie rules leagues in every country if you, you look hard enough yeah um maybe a little bit of a tangent there but um yeah i know i know a little bit i know a little bit about uh, uh, aussie rules um no, great in terms of the uh, the background of you know uh, athletes throwing to being created and background to yourselves and the the sort of the first question that i wanted to dive dive into is especially from uh, people from the outside, you know, looking in, he's like, right, what special thing do athletes train? Do you have to, what do you have to do to train like like an athlete? Um, and from both of your experiences, sort of the first question, if you like, is what does training look like an athlete look like or what does that actually 
mean you know from obviously that as a that that as a brand you know what's your uh, philosophies on training and you know getting the best out of the athletes that you're working with yeah definitely um i'll kick off but <clears throat> i reckon the two big things that that set apart an athlete training versus your general prop pop is is more around one consistency <clears throat> athletes are more consistent true athletes are far more consistent they turn up they train they do what needs to be done rather than general pop will always have an excuse because training comes second, everything else will come first. When you're an athlete, that the training comes first because that's your priority. Um, that is, you know, you, you make your money on the weekend. You, you have to play well. You have to be ready. You have to be fit. Um, training comes first. Uh, and that's, you know, me and Carl joke about it, but um, that's why everyone can't be an athlete. These, these models where people go, you know, anyone can train like an athlete. And it's, it's bullshit. Like, the, the culture that an athlete has, the energy they have in the gym, very different to someone who's general pop. That's not to say there's not general pop or you know, obviously with the evolution of CrossFit become quite big. There's certainly people we know that are just general pop that probably prioritise their training ahead of everything. So that does have the same mentality. Like you feel the same energy. Like when they prioritise their training like that, whether their wife agrees with it or not, they're doing what athletes do. So that's the number one, that they're, they're prioritising their training and they're, they're consistent with what they do. The second layer is that they're always looking for that 1%. So they're always looking for the ice bar, the compression, the massage, the physio. There's all those accessory things that I think a lot of general pop people don't do. They might enjoy getting in, they enjoy lifting weights, they enjoy doing an arm session or something like that and the feeling of that pump. But they're not going to go home and then you know, eat the right things, get to bed at the right time, do your ice baths and everything like that so they can perform even better the next day. They're almost content and happy with the feeling of just training. So there's those two levels to an athlete that is that they live and breathe their training. And when I say training, it's both in the gym, but also their skills training. They're sort of one and the same. Um, but then they'll do everything they can to maximise that training and to make sure that they're moving forward every day, every week. Um, and I think those two things, although there's hundreds of different minutiae that you could talk about that, that an athlete has that maybe general pop doesn't, those two rocks for me are what make the training part so black and white when you look at an athlete versus general pop. And here at Athletes Authority, we, we do have pros, we have semi-pros, but we've also got third graders that want to get to second grade. And the way we filter that is, well, is this third grader that wants to get the second grade, are they prioritising their training? Are they training for their sport? If they are, great. Are they consistent? Great. Are they then doing the extra parts? Are they eating well? They're wanting to sleep well. They're wanting to get the recovery in. Well, tick. So they may not be getting paid to make their living with sport, but they embody the exact same principles that we want to create in our athletes and that culture. Therefore, they align with our principles and we're more than happy to bring them on board and, and bring them into the fold and, and try and get them to second grade. Who knows, first grade. But you don't have to be a professional athlete to have that athlete mindset, but definitely not everyone can be an athlete. Yeah. You, two two things that you kind of you mentioned there is obviously the um you know they're going to earn their money on a on a weekend that's the performance that that, that counts um but also the the consistency and you mentioned a couple of levels there that that, that you work with in terms of um uh, the progression or the layers that you would add on depending if they're you know uh, uh, trying to get into second grade or semi professional professional do you add more layers as sort of the the level of the athlete uh, increases or the athlete progresses, or are those principles the exact same? It's just maybe they develop more as an athlete the longer that you do the, the longer that you work with them. If that kind of makes sense. Yeah, well, look, I think it's a, an overarching principle that that those principles that we work with apply to the best of the best through to our youngest or our least experienced. Principles don't change on that front, but. As they are higher up the rank, <clears throat> the typical thing is they probably actually have less to work on and you're actually just sharpening the swords that are there. Um, when they're an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old, it, it's quite a broad base. We're kind of dabbling in everything. We're trying to progress a lot of things, see what comes to fruition. As they get to that a little bit older, they might be sitting second grade. You probably highlight a handful of things that they need to work on to get to the next level. When they're at the pros, they're, they might be 25, 26, they're on their biggest contract. That's that's where they're at. It's about one, 
sustaining why they got there because believe it or not, not everyone can get better at everything. It's just the way it is. When you're 25, 26, you know, you're on your million dollar contracts. You're there because you've got a couple of things that are bloody good and probably bloody better than everyone else. So it's about maintaining them and reducing the degrade of that. Um, but then trying to just minimize those downsides, minimize those weaknesses. You're not going to make someone who's a big bopper, who's kind of slow, suddenly quick. But can you make sure that their slowness, so to speak, doesn't make them so weak that they can't execute certain things? But you're also not going to drop all of their, their muscle mass and even sometimes fat mass for them to be faster because if they're rugby and they're sitting in the middle, well, they've got to take the hit. So it's it's really important to understand with the, the senior guys and girls that are already in the pros, it's about maximising what they put out and not losing that. But then just trying to protect against those weaker sides, not sacrificing what's really good to make what's really bad a little bit better and trying to make them this even keel because the fact that they're there suggests that they're not good at everything. They're probably great at a few things and you've got to make sure you keep that greatness. Yeah, definitely. I think that's an interesting point because everyone thinks that if you uh, train like train like an athlete, everything needs to be right at the top. Whereas some of the things you know that you're not so good at just have to be good enough. You know, depending on your position or the or right. the sport that you're playing. Which I think sometimes people forget. You know, not every yeah. I know there's some athletes that you know. Um, will smash everything, you know, which will, will come along every so often, whereas more often than not, like what you mentioned about the the principles, you know, outside of the gym as well, you just want to make sure that those, like you say, those not so good things are, are, are just good enough. One thing that I wanted to, to chat with you both about as well is um, sometimes, you know, a variety of, of, of sports that you've, that you've mentioned there. What are your thoughts on when people think about, um, uh, coming in and training and the need to be doing something really specialist for their sport is specialism or specializing. I don't know how you, how you would phrase that. Um, can that sometimes be more of a hindrance than a help? Is that, is that a thing or does it have its place within that training? Yeah, definitely. Do you, do you want me to take that one? <clears throat> oh, no, I'll, I guess I'll share my thoughts and then Locke will yeah, work yeah. Yeah. something to add, right? We typically see we manage the athlete first before we address the sport, although the sport comes into the decisions we make with the athlete. So an athlete comes in our processes that we take them through our lead athlete game plan, which identifies their strengths, their weaknesses, their blind spots within the domains of physical fitness and capability, so their strength, power, speed, um, jump height, et cetera, movement quality, whatnot. They're going to be the primary things that we first look at. The, the biggest opportunities that exist physically um, from that perspective, we look at first and then we layer in, well, what other demands do we need um, from that, that are governed by their sport to make sure we're optimizing their performance? So Lockheed's built an incredible system where we've got these base programs which allow us to capture the essence of what the demands are of a sport. An athlete slides in to that base program. That sets the base template for them, but then their individual needs kind of overlay on top of that um, and take essentially priority on, on that. For example, you know, if, if an athlete is, if the template um, is asking for a trap by deadlift, but the athlete doesn't, doesn't need it, or um, even more so maybe it's not advised that they do a trap by deadlift, then we modify if they, if they can do trap bar deadlift and it will tick the box and it will be fine, we'll usually keep it. So the template exists kind of as a baseline and then individual needs overlay on top of it. Did I, did I miss anything there, Locke? That's nah, spot on. I think the, the overarching premise of what we try and do is when you look at sports, there, there's more similarities than there are differences. Uh, and that, that phrase itself sort of sits above everything we do. Um, and we look for avenues to align athletes. The, the best thing about our facility and our, our culture, and I'm biased here because I think it's the best in the world, um, but it's because athletes train together, they celebrate together, um, and a lot of that's to do with the fact that they can actually align with some of their programming. And not all of it. Um, there's obviously going to be the individualizations that are needed. Um, but if you're a, here in Australia, we I, I think worldwide we have the most field-based sports all kicking off at the same time. It's very, very few countries We've got Rugby Union, Rugby League, AFL, NRL, and then A-League, which is our soccer. Five arguably dominant field sports that, within reason, 
when you're in your teens, could probably go between all five if you're athletic and quick. You know, you look at any other country, there's very few sports that are going to roll five dominant sports where you're actually going to be competing for athletes. So we're not a big country. So when you look at that within our in our system, you've got five sports that are all played on, on grass that all require reasonable amount of running, give and take, reasonable amount of speed, and to an extent, muscle mass in some of them. So, And they all have the same season, give or take a month here and there. So you better believe that when you've got a soccer player, an AFL player, a, a leaguey coming in, and they're all kind of around round five of their in-season program, that if we've dominated, a, if we've decided the trap bar deadlift is the, the exercise of choice that we're trying to get out of it, probably a lot of our field sport athletes are going to be doing it. So they get to work together. You know, you, you probably your, your older school thought is, oh, well, soccer, rugby league, well, they, they shouldn't be doing the same. They should all be doing different things. But as your big bopper, if you've decided as a knee dominant lift, you want to get them stronger, like why would they be doing all different exercises within reason? Now, as Carl alluded to, there's going to be individualizations. Some might have shoulder issues, so they might put on a safety bar, these type of things. They might have tendon issues, so they might be reduced ranges. But your, your big key lifts, we try and align where we can because those people get to train with each other, get to support each other, compete with each other. And the benefits that it has where an AFL player competes with a rugby league player, AFL player is only going to get stronger. And then the inverse, when you're doing field work and you're doing speed, change of direction, conditioning, you better believe that the rugby league player is going to try and get better with the AFL boy. Um, so there's all these different scenarios where working together creates our culture and um, there's the individualizations that layer across. But I think the actual, the, the, um, the unique part about our program is actually where we can align it more than actually make it individual. Yeah, definitely. I thought there was there was some uh, some really good points there, especially from the system that you have uh, in terms of programming. But then equally as well, you know, um, rather than thinking that there's this you know magic formula exercise or silver bullet that you know people are going to use for their specific sport, you know, for the majority of sports, like you know, you mentioned five there, people need to be strong, they need to be powerful, then they, 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 they need to be fast. So it's you know you can pick things pick things up from there. One thing that you that you they were mentioning there in terms of you know a, a rugby player you know training with a, a, an AFL athlete as well and this is something that um uh, you've kind of both touched on is the is the culture or the environment that you mentioned at you know at athletes authority and this is kind of one of the main things that I wanted to um uh, touch on which I think is um I find quite an interesting topic is that nature versus nurture and the culture and the environment that you train in, because you mentioned there about the principles outside, are they eating enough? Are they wanting to get up and train? Are they, are they, are they being consistent? And I just kind of wanted to touch on, you know, um, the uh, how you wanted to create that that culture and environment at Athletes Authority and how much of an impact that has on your athletes, as well as the training, but also that environment of, you know, competition in, in, in sessions and wanting to progress. But it's, it's funny you say that statement because we haven't always had this direction in philosophy um, prior to Lockie coming on board and, and had taken control of the program. I was very much of the, the positioning that individualization was key. You know, why else would someone come join Athletes Authority to get a, 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 a templated based program um, that they could otherwise get from an SNC coach? So our, our philosophy was that things were hyper-individualized to the point where I could walk in, I would know what a Seton program was, what a Mick program was, what an Ellie program was, because they were so different. And the, the coach brought in their own kind of, their, their own uh, kind of flair to the point I could see exactly who's, who, was, who was their managing coach. And we thought that was the best way to go, except not only was it a logistical nightmare, it created these pods or these silos where, you know, the athletes were overly attached to a specific person rather than being attached to the system. So when Lockie came on through, we kind of scrapped that. And in fairness and to give credit, we had what I, at least for me, probably wasn't so for Lockie, but for me, a very much an eye-opening conversation with Mike Boyle. Lock and I sat down. It was just prior to COVID. Lockie had just come on board. You know, me and Locke were looking at our program going, you know, 
what what can we change? How can we improve this? And Mike reached out to Mike and said, Mike, you know, will you sit down and consult for us for now? We just want to run some stuff by you. One of the big items for me coming from that individualized dominant kind of paradigm was that Mike had built this business that was essentially built on one training philosophy and one training program for all his athletes, which was like the pendulum had shifted the other way. And I was, I was very easily convinced on that. And I was like, let's just do it. We all do one program and Lockie, you know, being the smart, sensible man, he is kind of pulled me into the middle and said, well, look, why don't we actually just write base programs for dominant sports and categories of sports? And that's end up where we landed. And the rest is history. We went from, what, 76 athletes, all on individualized programs where we were really stretched um, personnel-wise on providing these programs to both those coaches leaving, our morning coach, our afternoon coach leaving, not because Lockie turned up, but just by fluke, they one got poached and one, you know, followed his missus to another state and Lockie was left by himself. And Lockie managed to train 76 athletes by himself. He wrote 76 goddamn fucking programs every single Sunday and adapted it only because of the effectiveness of his system. Um, and the I, understanding I, of my wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a very understanding wife. Um, thankfully, not two kids back then. Um, yeah. And that was, it. that was a huge shift, Stephen, to realize that, you know, to Lockie's point, there are more similarities than differences. And that athletes are not coming to you for individualization. They're coming to you for results. They just think that they want individualization. That's the difference. They think they want sports specific because that will get them the result. They think they want individualization because that will get the result. What they want is the result. And now what we've been able to build is a system which where the system gets the, the result, not the individualization. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to take it all back, strip it all back, look at the pure objective numbers. Two years ago on a fully individualized model, we had 76 athletes. Um, to this point now we have, what, 284 um, so I, I, I think I think to that point, the system was the solution and individualization was was hamstringing us. I think I what you... Well, sorry, go on. Uh, Lachlan, sorry. No, I was, was going to say that, that to that, like it's people probably try and go to the two extremes. They, they try and have really individualized programs or they go to this cookie cutter where everyone just does the same program and there's no adaptation. And I think they... <clears throat> A system for me, I've always said that a good system, a really good system will still only account for 80%, you know, your 80-20 rule, you could call it 90-10, whatever you want, but it's really going to only account for that amount. And that's all you need it to, because if you if you try and create a system for 100% of people, you will lose your freaking mind. And too many people try to do that and then revert away and they keep changing their system. If you're trying to do that, you're going to kill yourself. So the, the idea of a system is to create something that can allow you to reduce your time load down drastically. And what I mean by that is if I've got 100 athletes I'm managing, 80 of those athletes should almost be taking care of this nice flowing system, which allows me to then spend the time that I need to spend on those annoying, I'll call it annoying, 20% that do require a little bit more individualization, that always have tendon pain that always have hip pain, that have always got these little things. But if you're trying to do that one, if you're trying to individualize every single one of them, but like every coach is out there has done it. Every coach has got a list of athletes. They've gone through it on a Sunday and they seem to be going well at the beginning of the day and the evening's starting to roll, the sun's setting. You're like, fuck, the missus wants to have dinner. You've got four athletes left. You just rush through them. And most people who do it alphabetically, so it's the same four athletes every bloody <laughs> Sunday that you just rush through. Um, we've all been there. And if, if you don't admit it, you're kidding yourself. Um, so it's trying to create something that allows you, but 80% of those athletes on that list, whether you're only working with 10 or you're working with 80, that you can, you can systemize that. So you can actually spend the time that you need for those more niggly programs that you've got to adjust. Um, and I think, as I said, People have probably got their own systems, their own way of doing it. Um, for us, it's worked exceptionally well. Um, and, and to Carl's point about, you know, coaches still bringing their flair, it's still important that we have avenues that coaches can be creative um, because otherwise you don't attract good coaches because coaches don't want to just fall into a system and just follow that. What it allows them to actually do is that 80% 
is already taken care of, which means I've actually got more energy to be more creative with our more um, minute or our more high end athletes that do need a little extra more. It could be a simple 14 year old kid that's got 15 different training sessions. So the coach needs to spend a little bit more time mapping out that week. It could be a, a professional athlete that is just athletically dominant, but just needs to find 1% so they can actually spend time introducing some more advanced principles within their program. So I think the system, some people say cookie cutter, and I'm saying that I actually reckon it's the opposite. It actually allows greater energy to be far more specific and create far better programs for those that require it. Yeah, definitely. I thought there was there was two really good points there. One about, you know, um, at the end of the day, it's the results that count. You know, if the athlete is coming in and they're actually getting slower and getting weaker, hang on a minute there's you know i'm but sure there's going to be a, yeah 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 you know they, they, I, i'm sure i'm sure there would be a, you know a lot of, uh, you know a, a lot of, a lot of questions from that but also you know a couple of things that you mentioned there as well is time so you can actually spend time because if you're you know spending uh you know a long long time putting programs together you know you're going to end up being tired not being able to put the effort into into the sessions but to be able to spend you know um uh, or add that flair in there or spend time with other other athletes that might need you know a little bit more uh, attention if you like one thing from and, there in terms of the, to be honest i'm gonna so, i'm gonna jump in there because i'm sure someone's gonna listen to this and take me out of context and say Lockie Wilmot doesn't believe programming is important. It is. <laughs> it's important. But I can tell you right now, if you're exhausted from programming over the weekend, then the most important part is coaching. And you can take a crap program and coach the hell out of it and get good results. But if you're so tired from trying to perfect the most perfect rep and set scheme for every single athlete over the weekend, and you're exhausted during the week that you can't even coach that program well, then you're doing a disservice. I can tell you right now, if I had to pick one, now you never have to pick just one, but if I had to, coaching is always going to win because you can take the world's worst program, coach the hell out of it, create energy, create consistency, create buy-in, create that energy to come back and improve, and that's what's going to get the result, not specifically the program you've written. But I'm also going to finish and bookend that by saying programming is still important. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one of my. I, I like that as a, a, a as a quote. You know, if you follow, you could if you're consistent and follow a crap program and have the coaching with it, you're still going to get results rather than not following a re, a, a really a really good program. And I think that's something. You know, um, there's lots of uh, information and content out there on programming, whereas I think sometimes you can go too far that end rather than actually focus on the um, the coaching skills or the art of coaching. If if you like, would you kind of both agree with that? What What are your thoughts? I know this is a little bit of a tangent from from what we were saying. Yeah, no, look, I, I agree with that, but I also think um, a coach's life cycle is quite compartmentalized in that. Um, like, for example, Brett Bartholomew, like obviously I always bring him up whenever you talk about buying, like he's probably the, the leading coach at the moment that's actually pushing the, the standard of it. Um, but I also believe like a, as an evolution of coaching, when I was a kid, like you, you, you've got to understand all the methods. Like you've got to just, you've got to go into the reps and sets. Like it's just the, the gradual evolution of a coach. That's not to say young coaches probably shouldn't start earlier in their knowledge of, of how to interact and how to connect and stuff like that and understanding it it probably isn't a soft science there's there is some hard science to how you can engage with people and how you can get by in it and Carl's one of the best to speak about when it comes to that framing of things and selling things to people and when I say selling I mean getting them to understand the results they want and, and what would happen if they didn't have those results it's a powerful thing to have even as a young coach but if you don't know the X's and O's, then it's pointless. So I think there's there's a time and a place to dedicate. I think as young coaches, I still think that the X's and O's are something that they do need to just delve into. Um, and as they get older, they can start to layer in more and more of other things. Um, but that's not to say they shouldn't start that journey earlier. Yeah, definitely. And you, you kind of gravitated um, to the to the next part that I wanted to chat about in terms of because you mentioned there about the systems that you've got uh, got in place. And, you know, when the athletes walk through athletes and clients walk through the door, how does how did that sort of um, uh, then move into how you um, 
sold yourself as a business and expanded as a business? Was it a case of, you know, that change in um, uh, the coaching side of things, you know, naturally made it uh, easier to sell to athletes to wanting to come to you for your principles that you put out there? How did kind of the, the business side of things tie in with the, the systems that you got in with coaching? Right. Well, the, the big change when Lockie implemented a, a culture-centric, athlete-centric training environment might be the way we describe it, um, is people had, there was more value in the athlete being around others than being by themselves. And that was probably the difference, right? On an individualized training program in our old model, it made no difference whether you're around other athletes or by yourself. The training experience was essentially the same. When Lockie shifted the model, the training experience actually now benefited from athletes being around other athletes. You know, when if you if all the field athletes had a trap bar deadlift, it was there was incentive to have more people trap bar deadlifting. So what ends up happening is because now the experience is augmented, um, athletes say, "Hey, you know, to another field sport athlete, hey, you got to train it. Um, you know, got to train athletes authority. It's, it's a sick environment to come and train in." And so that drove a lot of the word of mouth referrals, which previously were almost non-existent as an individualized model we were their, their best kept secret and I, I put that in you know quotation marks we were the thing they didn't want to talk about because we were this this really fancy individualized program that you know they won't get anywhere else and need be kind of kept under lock and key when Lockie shifted the model and I, I know I keep harping on about this but I do need to give credit where it's due when he shifted that model and shifted certainly my thinking around it um, we now benefited from the most important motivation that an athlete has, which is rivalry, <laughs> competition and rivalry, because no fucking athlete likes to lose. So now, you know, what we end up having off that is all these systems got built off the back of what Lockie did. We had records walls turn up. We did, uh, you know, group performance testing rather than individualized performance testing. All these things came off the back of that one decision to, to create a cultural, culture-centric training environment where that's really what we focused on um, and that's what really catapulted the business um, it was very convenient that you know the snc side came before the physio side because all we did is when we entered the physio market is we applied the exact same principles that were working for us in the performance department to the rehab department you know what fucking sucks when you get injured being the fucking loan and turning up to a four by four kind of physio and fucking pull on rubber bands for three months while he rehab his shoulder. We took what they wanted. Athletes want competition, rivalry, a sense of purpose, a sense of community, all those things that we were lacking in the old model, copy pasted the, the philosophy into the rehab space. And now the rehab program blew up because for once, you know, a re going to physio wasn't boring. Going to physio didn't mean you have to do it alone. Going to physio didn't have to magnify your injury. Going to physio meant you could train around others. Going to physio meant you could get stronger. Going to physio meant you could have fun with other athletes. Going to physio meant you could be motivated. Like it, it flipped that uh, that that script, I should say. And you know that's probably why we've had the. Uh, I wouldn't say unpredictable. I'd say almost uh, unrealistic. I'd say the results we've had are unrealistic. Um, for most growth trajectories for an SNC facility. Um, but that's also because we were willing to we were willing to kind of move away from the like that dogmatic thinking of individualization is is a must have or whatever it is. We we're willing to try out new ideas, always keeping the athlete front and center. What's going to be the experience that cultivates the best environment for the athlete? And I'd say that's probably what's resulted in, you know, us going from 76 athletes in November of 2019 on Lockheed's first day to um, August 1, 2022. So, you know, call it call it just over, um, yeah, just over two and a half years, about two and a half years, going to 284 athletes or whatever we're at. Um, and it's, it's, it's a result of that system um, and how that system's created other systems underneath it. Yeah, and I think it's also powerful to that that we we aren't a fit for everybody, and that's probably turning back time when you, you probably did get to that. You, you got a little bit of feedback, so you try and change something. A little bit of other feedback, you try and change something, and and we've sort of gone the opposite way because yeah, we alluded to Mike Boyle before. He's famous for saying that he doesn't put leaderboards up because the only people that like leaderboards are the ones that are on it. But if you're not on it, you don't like them. 
Now, we've made sure that we've cultivated individual experiences where you, you, you're beating yourself and you get your own results because I think that's important. But also, if that's your mentality, then we're not for you. If you don't want to get on the leaderboard, what are you doing? You know, we've, we've, in our rehab setting, we've had people who said, oh, the music's too loud. Guess what? We didn't turn it down. It, it's you're either in or this is not the fit for you, which is, and that's not to say aggressively, and we're not mean about it to them. But it's also like this is our gym is designed for a number of type of athletes that exist, but not all athletes that exist. So if you're not of that mentality, they don't enjoy it, and that's okay. But if we try and accommodate everyone, we accommodate nobody. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably the biggest lesson that we've had over the years that that we we go forth with what we believe is going to cultivate the best culture and the best outcome for a mix of what our system are, our personalities are, what we want to breed. The people that follow us and are ingrained in our system love it. And that's great. And they're the only people that we're accounting for. We also want to market ourselves to every other like-minded athlete out there that wants to come and get the best service and, and get the best results that they can. But it's also to say we know we're not suited to everyone. You know, if, if you're a if you're a long distance cyclist that's very internal. It probably just wants to focus on themselves, put headphones in. Like, we don't allow headphones in. No athletes train with headphones. You're not allowed to because you have to, one, be coached properly and you can't hear. But secondly, we want them to be engaged with the rest of the people in there. It's the same as you at a professional football club. They don't train with headphones in. They're disconnected. That's not what we want. So if you are an individual athlete like a long-distance cyclist, that you know, I say long distance, most of the cyclists who are going to be long distance, even the short distance still race a hell of a long way. But they're, they're far more internal. They're far more focused on themselves, and, and that's fine. But, but we're probably not the best fit. Simple as that. And we're not going to try and create ourselves as the best fit. Yeah, I, I love that in terms of, you know, uh, it's similar to like what you what you both mentioned at the start, you know, this is this is what we do. This is how we're going to work. And kind of two two questions from that is, do you think, um, especially with the model that you've that you've put in place, the system that you have put in place, obviously it works because you've been able to grow. Can you see more uh, facilities or coaches heading more towards that system? But then also on the flip side of that, um, you know, I know there'll be uh, coaches listening who are wanting to get athletes in to work with them and being like, yeah, I can, I, I can do this. I'll do this for you. Do you think sometimes, you know, that's what um, newer coaches coming in maybe struggle with in terms of being, no, this is actually what I'm going to, uh, going to focus on rather than, you know, having that um, uh, confidence to be like, no, actually I'm going to put these system systems in place and stick to the guns. If you like, if kind of those two questions make sense. 100% because Carl mentors are even a <laughs> Yeah. I do. So uh, a part of what I do is to, you know, we've we've taken the systems that have worked for us here and the coaches, S&C coaches, gym owners who um, want to run a model like ours and we're not trying to appeal to anyone who doesn't want a model like ours. Like we don't care, do, do what you want to do. But if you do want to kind of replicate or, or emulate what we've done, uh, we share our ideas. Um, and there are heaps of, heaps of gym owners are realising that it's unsustainable uh, both from a logistics standpoint, from a personnel standpoint, um, otherwise to 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 run it fully individualized, I've also realized it's it's almost impossible to run it one on one. I know I still see a lot of S and C gym owners and whatnot still trying to run one on one sessions and wondering why they can't seem to ever get ahead. Um, so there's a whole bunch of I, I, I feel like there's a lot of shifts going on, and a lot of people are realizing that you can run, you know, a, a, a group model that gets great results. Um, and when I say group, our athletes are between 15 and 20 athletes on the gym floor but at, at any one time. Um, you can run a model like that and, and it'd be very effective. Um, but on the flip side to you, I think the second part of your question, the only reason that young S&C coaches take anyone in and do whatever they want is because they just lack their identity. They're still trying to figure, figure it all out, figure out what they stand for and what they don't stand for. Um, and, and it probably oscillates and changes a bit more, I think, when, when you're a young coach. Um, you're probably also more likely to fall into um, kind of method-based thinking where, and I, I remember back when um, when I was a young coach and I was a kettlebells guy, then I was just barbells. And then you, know, you go through those phases where you kind of rely on methods um, a lot more. And I, I think most people grow out of that when they realize methods is, is just a means to the end and, and methods will apply across lots of different contexts when, when applied appropriately. And I think that usually phases out that lack of identity 
over time. It just it just takes some time. But yeah, more to your first point, absolutely. There's there's many gym owners wanting to apply this type of model, um, and and they're reaching out to us all the time to help. Yeah, well, awesome. Sometimes it's it's a, it's an argument I kind of have with myself a little bit around <clears throat> evolution versus accelerated evolution of a coach. Like, oh, I think a lot of the mistakes I made and and phases I went through make me the coach I am. And so I don't think that coaches, um, gym owners, as they're young, go, but I think it's the type of stuff that you kind of need to go through to understand maybe why you don't do anything and stuff like that. And and I think probably the, the best I can come up with in the end is I think you, if younger coaches can be more aware of the direction that they can or will head, that's a big win. Not necessarily at 19 years of age, niche down know exactly what they <laughs> want to do like it's it's going to be really hard to do that um so i think as a, a 19 20 year old coach going through uni that's listening to these type of things like i don't think they necessarily need to rush off and find a niche and, and make sure they brand themselves as just this person all the time now look there might be ones out there that have already found it they they were a track i know there's a we're a track athlete they love track they love plyos that's all i want to do oh well that's you found it but if you haven't found that yet don't pretend to okay it just <laughs> just evolve but understand the benefits and, and where you're going to go and how you're going to grow as a coach um i think just being aware of it's a big win when you're a young coach yeah definitely and that kind of uh, leads leads nicely into the um uh, it's as though you were so you're reading my notes that I, that, that i put down there but um uh, a lot of you know uh, good conversation that we've had uh, in this episode. Really enjoyed uh, chatting chatting with you both. The last question that I like to ask from everything that we've that we've chatted about there, and you you kind of touched on a couple of points, is for everyone listening, whether it be an athlete or or a coach, what would be your take home points or words of wisdom? <clears throat> okay, um, I will go from a pure coaching standpoint. Um, my opinion is when it comes to coaches, um, we naturally like to gravitate towards somebody, something, some company. Um, and I've certainly done it like back in the Poliquin check days, like we do that. And I think there's there's a lot of healthy things that can come out of that type of drive. But I think with the just plethora of, of information that's out there at the moment, that it's as if for someone to like something, they have to hate something else. And that's how they contrast all of their content and everything like that. I think if you can be a coach that can understand that everything is contextual and looking at how you can actually utilize these different methods under broader principles, then you're miles ahead of 80% of the coaches out in this world because so many get so attached to one way, ingrained in one way, and because that everything else is wrong, then I think that's a big win for a young coach. You can have your methods, you can have things that you love, things that work well in your context, but not because you hate something else. Because for you as a coach, where you're at at the moment could be at a fitness first, like a gym, could be at a private facility, could be with a team sport athlete, an individual athlete. I still to this day argue about plyometric training with track coaches because I don't train track athletes. I train team sport athletes and it's very different. They're very different in the way they load. Their weekly schedules are very different. What I need to get out of them is very different. Even though people say they still have to jump higher, yet the outcome is the same, but the process is very different. But that doesn't mean I then say that's stupid. I just know that it doesn't, apply in the setting that I'm currently in and everything that I ever talk about if you've ever listened to me talk before most of it is coming from my context and that's what I've applied and what I've done so the more coaches that can understand that even slight changes in your context will actually influence your methods dramatically the better off will be awesome gee whiz how do I beat that <laughs> um <laughs> I'll give it a crack. Um, probably may, maybe more so to the to the point of you know if I were to if I was listening to this and I was also back in 2019 running the model that we we're running, feeling like I need to I needed to maintain the model that we we're operating in. Before you can act differently and have something different to what you've got, you have to think differently um, and and giving yourself permission to consider 
that there might be another way to do this is is where you started. And it wasn't until Lockie kind of a a kind of reviewed the whole programming system that we had, but then also recommended, you know, let's chat to to Mike who's done things very differently and he's been around for a long time, that I really um really grasped that idea that, you know, there were other ways to skin the cat that that might be more feasible um, for a business. And, you know, from the business context, that context, that really comes into play. The model that we were running would have never gotten us here. Like it would have never gone us to 284 athletes. No matter what way we tried, we would have, we would have had 284 athletes, about 65 staff. And at that point, we wouldn't have had enough money to fund the 284 athletes. So like it was, it was, it would have never worked. So I, my recommendation would be if you're a young coach or specifically if you're a business owner uh, and you're looking at your business model, you're looking at your, your net margins, you're looking at um, your gross and you're going, there simply is enough money for me to thrive. Before your business can be different and for it to change, you need to think differently. Um, and I'd be an advocate for you um, finding people and looking outside what might be your, your circle of confidence to people who are doing things differently, um, who might be achieving things that, that you'd like to achieve but can't yet figure out because there's this old idea that you know what got you here won't get you there um, and the, the farther that that is out in the future the more that your systems your processes your your thinking your ideology your philosophies will need to adapt and change and um you know we're going through this process again you know me and Lockie are adding arms to, to athletes authority re-establishing the vision of what it does and and you know for us to achieve what we want to achieve from Athletes authority, that's a constant iterative process. Um, and I would advocate for, for a coach who's, who's stuck in their ways because they, they think it's the only way. Um, I'd, I'd tell them, you know, potentially explore what else is out there because it might unlock an opportunity to, to, a, um, to massive things for your business. Some really good words of wisdom there. You sure you both didn't uh, rehearse uh, re- rehearse those? Um, no, really, really, really good. Thanks a lot for uh, for for taking the time to to jump on. Really, really enjoyed um, chatting with you both today. And like I say, some really good uh, words of wisdom to finish on. Um, for anyone listening who might have any questions about what we've chatted about today, see the content that Athletes Authority put out there. Um, where could people find you or or, or reach out to you? Uh, so we are, I'm performance coach underscore Wilmot uh, on Instagram. Uh, I promise I'll get back to posting soon. Uh, I'm just trying to catch up on sleep with the two girls. <laughs> um, but a, as a whole, we are at Athletes Authority on Instagram is probably the two easiest ways. Um, but then our website, which is www.worldwideweb.athletesauthority.com.au. Um, uh, so there's a whole heap of stuff there from business mentorship side through to the education side we do um, through to then uh, a number of programs and the way we lay it out and our service model and everything like that. So well worth having a look if uh, anyone's interested. Yeah, just a quick rundown. If you like long form content, go to our podcast. If you like short form content, go to the Instagram. If you want emails written about the business, go to the the email business subscription Um, and yeah, if you, if you want copies of our programs or our philosophy, download the KBLR programs that are on our website, um, as well as we've got some free gifts there, mental skills training, recovery systems that coaches can use with their athletes, um, which, are, which are a great assistance. Awesome. Thanks a lot for taking the time to jump on. Thanks a lot to everyone listening, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>